Hi, and welcome to the lecture on environmental emergencies. We're now on chapter 30 of your text, and we're just about finished. We only have a few more chapters to go. After you complete this chapter and all related coursework, you will understand the physiology of environmental injuries. You will have learned the proper assessment and management of general and specific types of environmental emergencies, including hypothermia, local cold injuries such as frostbite, and heat exposure illnesses such as heat stroke. You will also learn the associated signs and symptoms of, and emergency treatment of drowning, diving emergencies, high altitude sickness, lightning strikes and bites and envenomations from spiders, hymenoptera, snakes, scorpions, ticks, and marine life. As we have discussed the EMS National EMS Education Standard competencies previously, under trauma you will apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. Specific to environmental emergencies, the EMT will recognize and manage submersion incidents and temperature related illnesses and will also be able to discuss the pathophysiology as well as assess and manage patients who are victims of near drownings, temperature related illnesses, and bites and envenomations, as well as disparism, including high altitude sickness and diving injuries, electrical injuries, and radiation exposure. Heat and cold overwhelm the body's mechanisms for regulating temperature and as a result of this, medical emergencies can result from the exposure to heat or cold. Certain populations are at a higher risk for heat and cold emergencies, and these include children, older people, individuals with chronic illnesses, and young adults who overexert themselves. Water recreation can also create medical and trauma emergencies, including localized injuries and systemic illnesses. Environmental emergencies require prompt treatment in the hospital. Some of the factors affecting exposure. There are a number of factors that affect how a person deals with heat or cold. The first is physical condition. Patients who are ill or in poor physical condition will not tolerate extreme temperatures well. Age. Age extremes do not tolerate temperature changes well. For example, infants are poor thermoregulators and they have the inability to shiver. They cannot generate heat when needed until about 12 to 18 months of age and they have a larger surface area and a smaller mass. Children may not think to or be able to put on additional clothing layers. Older adults lose subcutaneous tissue and have reduced insulation. They also suffer from poor circulation and some of their medications may affect their body's ability to thermoregulate. Nutrition and hydration. A decrease in either will aggravate hot or cold stress. Calories provide fuel to burn, creating heat during the cold, and water provides sweat for evaporation and removing heat. Alcohol will change the body's ability to regulate temperature. Environmentally, there are conditions that can complicate or improve environmental situations, such as the air temperature, the humidity level, and the wind. Extremes in temperature and humidity are not needed to produce injuries, either hot or cold. Most hypothermia occurs at temperatures between 30 and 50, and most heat stroke occurs when the temperature is 80 and the humidity is 80. You should examine the environmental temperature of your patient and due to cost concerns realize that older patients may not heat or air condition their homes sufficiently. Some people may not open windows in a heat wave because they fear burglars. The first topic we're going to discuss is cold exposure. The body's temperature is maintained within a very narrow range in order for the body's chemistry to work efficiently. If the body or any part of it is exposed to cold environment, these mechanisms may be overwhelmed. Cold exposure may cause injury to the feet, the hands, the ears, the nose, or the whole body, and this is called hypothermia. There are five ways the body can lose heat. The first is conduction. This occurs either from a direct transfer of heat from a part of the body to a colder object by direct contact, and you should realize that heat can also be gained if the substance being touched is warm. Convection. This is a transfer of heat to circulating air, as when cool air moves across the body. Evaporation is a conversion of any liquid to a gas. This is the natural mechanism by which sweating cools the body, and measures should be taken to keep a person dry if he or she is too cold. Radiation, transfer of heat by radiant energy. Radiant energy is a type of invisible light that transfers heat. Respiration. Respiration 
transfer of heat occurs because of the loss of body heat during normal breathing and warm air in the lungs ex is exhaled into the atmosphere and cooler air is inhaled. The rate and amount of heat loss or gain by the body can be modified in three ways. First, increase or decrease in heat production, shivering and increasing movement when cold, or decreasing and limiting movement when hot. Moving to an area where heat loss can be decreased or increased, you should seek shelter from the wind in cold environments and cover your head because this can minimize heat loss by 70%. Seek shade in a hot environment to cool a patient down. You can also wear insulated clothing which helps decrease heat loss in several ways. Clothing layers can trap air and provide good insulation. Protective clothing traps perspiration and prevents evaporation, and you should loosen or remove a patient's clothing to help cool them down. Hypothermia occurs generally when the core body temperature falls below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the temperature of the heart, the lungs, and the vital organs. The body loses the ability to regulate its temperature and generate body heat. Physiologically, to protect against heat loss, the body constricts the blood vessels in the skin and this results in the bluing of your lips or your fingertips. Secondarily, the body shivers to generate heat. As these mechanisms are overwhelmed, body functions begin to slow down. Eventually, key organs such as the heart begins to slow down and this can lead to death. The development of hypothermia can develop quickly as with cold water immersion or it can develop gradually as with exposure to the cold environment for several hours. Air temperature does not have to be below freezing for hypothermia to occur. The individuals who are most at risk include the homeless those people or those people whose homes lack heating, swimmers even in the summer, elderly and ill individuals who are less able to adjust to temperature extremes, young infants and children, because they are unable to put on clothes to protect themselves against the cold and they have a relatively large surface area and less body fat. Also, they have an inability to shiver effectively. Patients with injuries or illness, such as burns, shock, head injury, stroke, generalized infection, injuries to the spinal cord, diabetes, and hypoglycemia. Signs and symptoms of hypothermia. They become progressively more severe as the body's core temperature falls. Hypothermia generally progresses through four general stages. There's no clear distinction between the stages, but it will help you to estimate the severity of the problem. So this table here on 30-1 gives you the characteristics of systemic hypothermia. And we start with where the levels are for the core body temperature. And as it gets colder, you see what the signs and symptoms are that change and how your body responds and what your level of consciousness is. Once again, all of these tables make great study materials. Assess the general temperature. Pull back your glove and place the back of your hand on the patient's abdomen. If the abdomen feels cool, the patient is likely experiencing a generalized cold emergency. You may carry a hypothermia thermometer, which registers lower body temperatures, but it must be inserted into the rectum for an accurate core temperature reading. Regular thermometers will not register these low temperatures. Mild hypothermia occurs when the core temperature is between 90 and 95. The patient is usually alert and shivering, the heart rate and respirations are usually rapid, and the skin may appear red, pale, or cyanotic. I know the animation was playing as I was talking, but we're going to play it one more time and watch it together. As you can see, this patient is in the water. As his body temperature starts falling, he starts shivering. This is the normal response. More severe hypothermia occurs when the core temperature is less than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. At this time, shivering will stop and muscular activity decreases. As the core temperature drops toward 85 degrees Fahrenheit, the patient becomes lethargic and usually loses interest in fighting the cold. Their level of consciousness will decrease and they may try to undress. Poor coordination and memory loss follow along with reduced or complete loss of sensation to touch. Mood changes can occur and the patient will begin to show signs of impaired judgment. The patient becomes less communicative and they experience joint or muscle stiffness. They have trouble speaking and as the muscles eventually become rigid, the patient appears stiff or rigid. If the body temperature continues to fall to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, vital signs will slow, the pulse will become weaker and respirations slow to shallow or become absent. Cardiac arrhythmias may occur as the blood pressure decreases or disappears. As a core temperature of less, at a core temperature of less than 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 
all cardiorespiratory activity may cease, pupil reaction is slow, and the patient may appear to be dead or in a coma. The key rule is to never assume that a cold, pulseless patient is dead. In the medical community, the saying is, a patient is not dead until they're warm and dead. We're going to discuss local cold injuries next. Most injuries from cold are confined to exposed parts of the body. Extremities, especially the feet, the ears, the nose, and the face. When exposed parts of the body become very cold but not frozen, the condition is called frost nip, chill blains, or immersion foot or trench foot. When the parts become frozen, then it's called frostbite. And you can see some examples here. Important factors in determining the severity of a local cold injury include how long the exposure was, the temperature at which the body part was exposed, and what was the wind velocity during the exposure. You should also investigate a number of underlying factors such as exposure to wet conditions, inadequate insulation from cold or wind, and restricted circulation from tight clothing or shoes or circulatory disease, also fatigue and poor nutrition. Some other factors that we need to consider are alcohol or drug abuse, hypothermia, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and a patient who has an older age. Patients with hypothermia should be assessed for frostbite or other local cold injury. And remember, local and systemic cold exposure problems can occur in the same patient. Frost nip and immersion foot. Frost nip, after prolonged exposure to the cold, the skin is freezing but deeper tissues are unaffected. It usually affects the ears, nose, and the fingers, and it's not painful, so the patient often is unaware that a cold injury has occurred. Immersion foot, which is also called trench foot, occurs after prolonged exposure to cold water. It's very common in hikers or hunters who stand for a long time in a river or lake, and the signs and symptoms include the skin is pale and blanched and cold to the touch. Normal color does not return to after palpation of the skin, and the skin of the foot may be wrinkled but can also remain soft. The patient reports loss of feeling and sensation to the injured area. Most serious local cold injury because the tissues are actually frozen is called frostbite. This freezing permanently damages cells and the exact mechanism by which damage occurs is unknown. Gangrene, which is permanent damage or cell death, requires surgical removal of the dead tissue. The exposed part will become inflamed, tender to the touch, and unable to tolerate cold exposure. Signs and symptoms of frostbite are. Most frostbitten parts are hard and waxy. The injured part feels firm to frozen as you gently touch it. Blisters and swelling may be present, and in light-skinned individuals with a deep injury that is thawed or partially thawed, the skin may appear red with purple and white, or it may be mottled and cyanotic. The depth of skin damage will vary. With superficial frostbite, only the skin is frozen. With deep frostbite, deeper tissues are frozen, and you may not be able to differentiate between superficial and deep frostbite in the field. To assess cold injuries, we followed the same steps we followed all semester. Scene size up, primary assessment, history taking, secondary assessment, and reassessment. Management of hypothermia in the field, regardless of its severity, consists of stabilizing the ABCs and preventing further heat loss. Regarding scene size up, first of all, you need to note the weather conditions because they have a large impact on treatment of your patient. You need to note the air temperature, the wind chill, and whether the patient is wet or dry. You should ensure that the scene is safe for you and other responders and identify safety hazards such as icy roads, mud, or wet grass. You need to use appropriate standard precautions and consider the number of patients you may have. You should summon additional help as quickly as possible and reevaluate your mechanism of injury or nature of the illness. Look for indicators of the mechanism and consider how it produced the injuries that you are expecting. Primary assessment. Form your general impression. Perform a rapid scan to determine whether a life threat exists, and if so, treat it. If the chief complaint is simply being cold, quickly assess how cold the patient actually is. Check their temperature by feeling the patient's skin on the abdomen. Evaluate the patient's mental status very quickly by using the AVPU scale. And remember, an altered mental status can be affected by the intensity of the cold injury. Assess airway and breathing. Ensure that the patient has an adequate airway and is breathing. If your patient is breathing slow or shallow, ventilation with a bag mask device may be necessary. Warmed, humidified oxygen helps warm the patient from the inside out. Check circulation. You should palpate for a carotid pulse, and you should do this for at least 30 to 45 seconds to decide if your patient is pulseless. 
The American Heart Association recommends that CPR be started on a patient who has no detectable pulse or breathing. For a patient with hypothermia, this may require a prolonged pulse check. Perfusion will be compromised based on the degree of cold that the patient is experiencing, and the patient's skin will not be helpful in determining shock because you can assume that shock is present and treat accordingly. Bleeding may be difficult to find because of the slow-moving circulation and thick clothing. Make your transport decision. Complications can include cardiac arrhythmias and blood clotting abnormalities, and all patients with hypothermia require immediate transport. Assess the scene for the safest way to quickly move your patient from the cold environment, and remember, rough handling of a hypothermic patient may cause a cold, slow, weak heart to fibrillate and the patient to lose any pulse. If transportation is delayed, protect the patient from further heat loss. Take a history. First of all, investigate the chief complaint. Get a medical history and be alert for injury-specific signs and symptoms as well as pertinent negatives. Obtain a sample history. If possible, find out how long your patient has been exposed to the cold environment because exposures may be acute or chronic. Medications your patient has taken and underlying medical problems may have an impact on the way cold affects his or her metabolism. The patient's last oral intake and what the patient was doing prior to the exposure will help to determine the severity of the cold problem. Perform a secondary assessment. This is your physical exam. You want to focus your physical exam on how bad the hypothermia really is. Assess the areas of the body directly affected by cold exposure and assess the degree and extent of damage. The numbing effect of cold, both on the brain and on the body, may impair your patient's ability to tell you about other injuries or illnesses. You should pay special attention to skin temperatures, textures, and turgor. Take vital signs. They may be altered by the effects of hypothermia and can be an indicator of its severity. Respirations may be slow and shallow, which will result in low oxygen levels in the body. Low blood pressure and a slow pulse also indicate moderate to severe hypothermia, and you should evaluate your patient for changes in mental status. Utilize your monitoring devices. Determine a core body temperature using a thermometer based on your local protocols. A special low temperature thermometer is required to take a hypothermic patient's temperature, and this is generally done through the rectum. Remember that pulse oximetry will often be inaccurate due to the lack of perfusion in the extremities. Reassess. Repeat your primary assessment and reassess your vital signs and the chief complaint. Monitor your patient's level of consciousness and vital signs, and remember that rewarming may lead to cardiac arrhythmias. Review all treatments that have been performed and reassess oxygen delivery. Remove any wet or frozen clothing, and do not remove any clothing that is frozen to the patient's skin. Communicate all of the information you have gathered to the receiving facility. This includes the patient's physical status, the conditions at the scene, and any changes in the patient's mental status during treatment and transport. General Management of Cold Emergencies The patient should be moved from the cold environment to prevent further heat loss. To prevent further damage to the feet, do not allow the patient to walk. Remove any wet clothing and place dry blankets over and under the patient. If available, give the patient warm, humidified oxygen and handle the patient gently. Do not massage their extremities and do not allow them to eat. Use any stimulants like coffee, tea, or cola, or smoke, or chew tobacco. If the patient is alert, shivering, responds appropriately, and their core body temperature is between 90 and 95 degrees, we consider this to be mild hypothermia. The treatment for this condition is to apply heat packs or hot water bottles to the groin, axilla, and cervical regions, to turn up the heat to high in the patient compartment of the ambulance, and to use caution and avoid burns and rewarm the patient slowly. You should give warm fluids by mouth if the patient can swallow. If the patient is suffering from moderate to severe hypothermia, you should not try to actively rewarm the patient. Rewarming may cause a fatal, fatal cardiac arrhythmia. Passive warming from high indoor heat should be reserved for an appropriate facility. Regional and state protocols may have passive rewarming protocol based on the patient's body temperature. Your goal is to prevent further heat loss, and the patient should be removed immediately from the cold environment and placed in the ambulance, and we should remove all wet clothing, cover them with a blanket, and transport. Patients should be handled, handled gently to decrease the risk of cardiac rhythm problems like ventricular fibrillation.
For emergency care of local cold injuries in the field, we should do the following. Remove the patient from further exposure. Handle the injured part gently and protect it from further injury. Administer oxygen if you're not already doing so from your primary assessment and remove any wet or restricted clothing over the injured part. Consider active rewarming. With frost nip, contact with a warm object may be all that is needed. For example, your hands or your breath or the patient's own body. The affected part will often tingle and become red in light-skinned individuals. With immersion foot or trench foot, take off wet shoes, socks, and boots. Rewarm the foot gradually, protecting it from further cold exposure. Splint the extremity and cover it loosely with a dry, sterile dressing. You should never rub injured tissues with anything because this can cause further damage and do not re-expose the injury to cold. With a late or deep cold injury like frostbite, be sure to remove any jewelry from the injured part and cover the injury loosely with a dry sterile dressing. Do not break blisters or rubber massage the area and do not apply heat or rewarm the part. Do not allow the patient to stand or walk on a frostbitten foot and evaluate for signs or symptoms of systemic hypothermia. Transport the patient promptly to the hospital. Rewarming in the field. If prompt hospital care is not available and medical control instructs you to begin rewarming in the field, use a warm water bath. Immerse the frostbitten part in water with a temperature between 100 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Check the water temperature with a thermometer before immersing the limb. Recheck the temperature frequently during the rewarming process and it should never exceed 105. You need to stir the water continuously and keep the frostbitten part in the water until it feels warm and sensation has returned. You should then dress the area with dry sterile dressings including between injured fingers or toes and expect the patient to report severe pain. Never attempt rewarming if there is any chance that the part may freeze again before the patient reaches the hospital. Cover the frostbitten part with soft padded sterile cotton dressings and if blisters have formed, do not break them. You are at risk for hypothermia yourself if you work in a cold environment. If cold weather search and rescue is possible in your area, then you need survival training and precautionary tips. Stay on top of the weather forecast and make sure you have proper clothing available and wear it whenever it's appropriate. Your vehicle must also be properly equipped and maintained and you cannot help others if you do not protect yourself. Next, we're moving on to heat exposure. E exposure. Regardless of the ambient temperature, the body stays at about 98.6. How the body does this is it tries to rid itself of excess heat through sweating and evaporation, dilation of skin blood vessels, and removal of clothing and relocation to a cooler environment. Hyperthermia is the core temperature of 101 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. When the body is exposed to more heat energy than it loses or it generates more heat than it can lose, hyperthermia results. The risk factors of heat illness include high air temperature because it reduces radiation, high humidity which reduces evaporation, lack of acclimation to the heat, and vigorous ex exercise causing a loss of fluids and electrolytes. Illness from heat exposure can take the following three forms. Heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. All of these may be present in the same patient. Individuals at greatest risk for heat illnesses are children, especially newborns and infants, elderly patients, patients with heart disease, COPD, diabetes, dehydration, and obesity, patients with limited mobility. Alcohol and certain drugs also will make a person more susceptible to heat illnesses. The first heat illness we're going to talk about is heat cramps. They're painful muscle spasms that occur after vigorous exercise. They do not occur only when it's hot outdoors. The exact cause is not well understood and large amounts of water can be lost from the body as a result of excessive sweating. It usually occurs in the legs or the abdominal muscles. Heat exhaustion is the most common illness caused by heat. We also call it heat prostration or heat collapse. Some of the causes include exposure to heat, stress, fatigue, hypovolemia, and this is generally as a result of the loss of water and electrolytes from heavy sweating. The signs and symptoms include dizziness, weakness, or faintness, a change in the level of consciousness with accompanying nausea, vomiting, or headache, muscle cramping, the onset while working hard or exercising in a hot, humid, or poorly ventilated environment and sweating heavily. Onset even at rest in the older and infant age groups in hot, humid, and poorly ventilated environments or extended time in hot, humid environments. Cold, clammy skin with ash and pallor, dry tongue and thirst, Normal vital signs, although the pulse is often rapid and weak and the diastolic blood pressure may be low. 
Normal or slightly elevated body temperature, on rare occasions it may be as high as 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Heat stroke is the least common but the most serious illness caused by heat exposure. It occurs when the body is subjected to more heat than it can handle and normal mechanisms for getting rid of the excess heat are overwhelmed. If left untreated, it always results in death. The typical onset situations include during vigorous physical activity, outdoors or in a closed, poorly ventilated, humid space, during heat waves without sufficient air conditioning or with poor ventilation, and children left unattended in a locked car on a hot day. And I'm sure most of you are aware that this is a major occurrence and there is a, a serious criminal trial going on or going to be going on in the Georgia area based on this over the last month or so. Signs and symptoms include hot, dry, flushed skin. Early on, the skin may be moist or wet, but it will dry out. Quickly rising body temperature, falling level of consciousness leading to the patient being unconscious, changes in behavior, and this may all lead to unresponsiveness. The patient may also experience seizures. They may have a strong, rapid heart rate at first, but it will become weaker with the falling blood pressure. They will have increasing respiratory rate and a lack of perspiration as the body has lost its thermoregulatory mechanisms. For assessment, just like for cold, we do the same things. With scene safety, once again, perform your environmental assessment and protect yourself from heat and biologic hazards. Use the appropriate standard precautions, including gloves and eye protection. You may need the assistance of advanced life support for administration of IV fluids. Look at your mechanism to understand how this emergency is, is happening and develop an early index of suspicion for underlying injuries. Perform a primary assessment. Form your general impression and observe how the patient interacts with you in the environment. Introduce yourself and ask about the chief complaint. A heat illness may be the primary or secondary condition and you should perform a rapid scan and avoid tunnel vision. Assess the patient's mental status using the AVPU scale and remember the more altered the patient's mental status is, the more serious the heat problem. Assess airway and breathing. Unless the patient is unresponsive, the airway should be patent. Nausea and vomiting may occur and you should position the patient to protect the airway as necessary. Breathing will be fast depending on the patient's core temperature and you should provide oxygen. If the patient is unresponsive, insert an airway and provide bag mask device ventilations. Circulation. It is assessed by palpating a pulse and if adequate, assess for perfusion and bleeding. Assess the patient's skin color, temperature, and condition and treat for shock by removing the patient from the heat and positioning the patient to improve circulation. If the patient is bleeding, bandage according to protocol. Table 30-2 gives you the common skin conditions for the heat emergencies and why they occur. Again, a great study guide. Make your transport decision. If your patient has any of the following signs of heat stroke, transport without delay. High temperature, red dry skin, altered mental status, tachycardia, and poor perfusion. Investigate your chief complaint. You should be alert for injury specific signs and symptoms such as absence of perspiration, decreased level of consciousness, confusion, muscle cramping, nausea, and vomiting. Obtain your sample history. Note any activities, conditions, or medications that may predispose a patient to dehydration or heat related problems. Some of the things we want to consider are inadequate oral intake and diuretics as well as certain psychiatric medications. You should determine your patient's exposure to heat and humidity and activities prior to the onset of symptoms. Perform your secondary assessment. Assess the patient for muscle, muscle cramps or confusion. Examine the patient's mental status and skin temperature and wetness. Take the patient's vital signs including body temperature. You should pay special attention to the skin temperature, turgor, and wetness. Gently pinch the skin on the forehead or back of the hand. Normally, the skin will quickly flatten out. If it doesn't, this is called poor skin turgor and the skin remains tinted and we see this in dehydration. Also, perform a careful neurologic exam. Take vital signs. Patients who are hypotherm hyperthermic will be tachycardic and tachypnic. Falling blood pressure indicates that the patient is going into shock. In heat exhaustion, the skin temperature may be normal or cool and clammy. In heat stroke, the skin will be hot. Check the patient's temperature with a thermometer depending on protocol, and if patients have a heat-related illness, you may also want to utilize pulse oximetry. Reassessment. Watch for deterioration, especially a decline in the level of consciousness. 
Vital signs should be monitored at least every five minutes and evaluate the effectiveness of your previous interventions. Be careful not to cause shivering when cooling down a patient with heat problems. Remove your patient from the hot environment and patients with heat cramps or exhaustion usually respond well to passive cooling of fluids by mouth. Patients with symptoms of heat stroke should be transported immediately and actively cooled. Inform the staff at the receiving facility early on that your patient is experiencing a heat stroke because additional resources may be required. And document weather conditions and the activities the patient was performing prior to the onset. Management of heat emergencies. For heat cramps, take the following steps. Remove the patient from the hot environment, administer high flow oxygen, rest the cramping muscles, and have the patient sit or lie down until the cramps subside. Replace fluids by mouth and use water or a diluted balanced electrolyte solution. Do not give salt tablets or solutions that have a high salt concentration. You can cool the patient with water spray or mist and add convection by manually or mechanically fanning your patient. When the heat cramps are gone, the patient may resume activity. The best preventative treatment strategy is hydration by drinking water. If the cramps do not go away after these measures, transport the patient to the hospital. For heat exhaustion, you're going to follow the steps in Skill Drill 30-1. For heat stroke, recovery depends on the speed at which treatment is administered, and you must be able to identify that this patient is suffering from heat stroke quickly. Emergency treatment has one objective, get the body temperature down by any means available. Take the following steps when treating a heat stroke patient. Move the patient out of the hot environment and into the ambulance. Set the air conditioning to maximum cool. Remove their clothing and give them 100% oxygen. Apply cool packs to the neck, groin, and armpits and cover the patient with wet towels or sheets or spray the patient with cool water and fan him or her to quickly evapor evaporate the moisture on the skin. Aggressively and repeatedly fan the patient and transport immediately to the hospital. Notify the hospital of an arriving heat stroke patient. Radiation exposure. Exposure to non-ionized radiation occurs on a daily basis from cell phones, microwave ovens, and UV rays from the sun. Long-term exposure to UV light is one of the main risk factors of skin cancer, and to protect yourself, you should wear a sunscreen with an SPF of at least 15 or higher. To treat a sunburn, remove the patient from the sun, and if it's severe, ALS intervention may be necessary for IV fluid replacement. Drowning. Drowning is the process of experiencing respiratory impairment from submersion or immersion in liquid. Some agencies may still use the term near drowning to refer to a patient who survives at least temporarily about 24 hours after suffocation in water. The risk factors include alcohol consumption, pre-existing seizure disorders, geriatric patients with cardiovascular disease, and unsupervised access to water. Drowning is often the last in a cycle of events caused by panic in the water. It can happen to anyone who is submerged in water for even a short period of time. Struggling toward the surface of the shore, the person becomes fatigued or exhausted, which leads him or her to sink even deeper. Drowning may also occur in mop buckets, puddles, and bathtubs. Laryngeospasm is inhaling very small amounts of either fresh or salt water, and it can severely irritate the larynx. The muscles of the larynx and the vocal cords will spasm, and this prevents more water from entering the lungs. In severe cases, progressive hypoxia occurs until the patient becomes unconscious. The spasm will then relax and the patient may now inhale deeply and more water may enter the lungs. Submersion incidents may be complicated by spinal fractures and spinal cord injuries. You should assume that a spinal injury exists with the following conditions. The submersion has resulted from a diving mishap or a long fall. The patient is unconscious and no information is available to rule out the possibility of a mechanism causing neck injury. The patient is conscious but complains of weakness, paralysis, or numbness in the arms and legs. You suspect the possibility of spinal injury despite what witnesses say. Most spinal injuries in diving incidents affect the cervical spine. Stabilization is necessary while the patient is still in the water and you should follow the steps in skill drill 20, I'm sorry, 30-2. Recovery techniques. If the patient is not floating or visible in the water, an organized rescue effort is necessary. Specialized personnel are required with snorkels, masks, and scuba gear. Scuba, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus gear, is a system that delivers air in the mouth and lungs at atmospheric pressures that increase with the depth of the dive. As a lapsed resort, a grappling iron or large hook may be used to drag the bottom for the victim. 
and the hook could seriously wound the patient and it may be the only effective way to bring the patient to the surface. Never give up on resuscitating a cold water drowning victim. Hypothermia can protect vital organs from the lack of oxygen and exposure to cold water will occasionally activate certain primitive reflexes which may preserve basic body functions for prolonged periods. Continue full resuscitation efforts until the patient recovers or is pronounced dead by a physician. The diving reflex, slowing of the heart rate caused by submersion in cold water, may cause immediate bradycardia from a slow heart rhythm. The diver may be able to survive for an extended period of time underwater thanks to a lowering of the metabolic rate associated with hypothermia. Continue full resuscitation efforts no matter how long the patient has been submerged. Diving Emergencies Most serious water-related injuries are associated with dives with or without scuba gear. Some of these problems are related to the nature of the dive, others result from panic. Panic can happen even to the experienced diver or swimmer. Medical problems relating to scuba diving techniques and equipment are becoming increasingly common. They're separated into three phases, descent, bottom, and ascent. Descent emergencies are caused by the sudden increase in pressure on the body as the person dives deeper into the water. Typical areas affected include the lungs, the sinus cavities, and the middle ear, as well as the teeth and areas of the face surrounded by the diving mask. The pain caused by these squeeze problems forces the diver to return to the surface to equalize the pressures and the problem clears up by itself. Divers with continued pain, particularly in the ear, after returning to the surface should be transported to the hospital. They may be suffering from a perforated tympanic membrane or a ruptured eardrum. Cold water may enter the middle ear through the ruptured eardrum and the diver may lose his or her balance and orientation. They may then shoot to the surface and run into ascent problems. Emergencies at the bottom rarely occur and generally these are caused by faulty connections in the diving gear. Inadequate mixture of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the air of the diver breathes is one cause, as well as accidental feeding of poisonous carbon monoxide into the breathing apparatus. Both of these can cause drowning or rapid ascent, and they require emergency resuscitation and transport. Ascent emergencies. Generally, these require more aggressive resuscitation. The first we'll talk about is an air embolism. It is the most dangerous and most common scuba diving emergency, and it is caused by bubbles of air found in the blood vessels. The problem starts when the diver holds his or her breath during a rapid ascent and the air pressure in the lungs remains at a high level while the external pressure on the chest decreases. The air inside the lungs expands rapidly, causing the alveoli to rupture. Complications may include air entering the pleural space and compress the lungs, called a pneumothorax. Air may also enter the mediastinum, the space within the thorax that contains the heart and great vessels, and causing a condition called pneumomediastinum. Air may enter the bloodstream and create bubbles of air in the vessels called air emboli. Some signs and symptoms of an air embolism include blotching or mottling of the skin, frothy, often pink or bloody, at the nose of the mouth, severe pain in muscles, joints, or the abdomen, dyspnea and possibly chest pain, dizziness, nausea, and vomiting, dysphagia, which is difficulty speaking, and a cough. Also cyanosis, difficulty with vision, paralysis, and coma. Patients may also experience irregular pulse and even cardiac arrest. Decompression sickness, commonly referred to as the bends. This occurs because bubbles of gas, especially nitrogen, obstruct blood vessels. The conditions that can cause decompression sickness are a too rapid an ascent from a dive, too long a dive at too deep a depth, repeated dives on the same day without the proper time intervals, and driving a car up a mountain or flying in an unpressurized airplane that climbs too rapidly after a dive. Nitrogen that is being breathed dissolves in the blood and tissues. The diver ascends and the external pressure is decreased. Dissolved nitrogen forms small bubbles within those tissues. Complications of decompression sickness include blockage of tiny blood vessels, depriving parts of the body of their normal blood supply, and severe pain in certain tissues or spaces. Signs and symptoms include abdominal and joint pain so severe that the patient doubles up. This is why it's referred to as the bends. You may find it difficult to distinguish between air embolism and decompression sickness. Air embolism generally occurs immediately on return to the surface, and symptoms of decompression sickness may not occur for several hours. 
Emergency treatment is the same for both basic life support and they will need recompression in a hyperbaric chamber. Patient assessment steps for drowning and diving emergencies are the same as for every other emergency. For scene safety, your standard precautions should include gloves and eye protection at a minimum. Never drive through moving water and be cautious driving through still water. Never attempt a water rescue without the proper training and equipment and you should call for additional resources early. Trauma and spinal stabilization must be considered in recreational settings and check for additional patients depending upon the situation. Look for indicators of the mechanism of injury and consider how it produced the injuries expected. Form your general impression. Pay attention to chest pain, dyspnea, and complaints of sensory changes when a diving emergency is suspected. Determine the patient's level of consciousness using the AFPU scale and be suspicious of alcohol use. Assess airway and breathing, and you should open the airway and assess breathing in all unresponsive patients. Take into consideration the possibility of spinal trauma and take the appropriate actions. Suction if the patient has vomited or if pink frothy secretions are found in the airway. If the patient is responsive, provide high flow oxygen with a non-rebreathing mask. Obtain and, obtaining and continually monitoring of breath sounds in drowning patients is a key part of your assessment. It may be difficult to find a pulse on these patients. If it's unmeasurable, the patient may be in cardiac arrest. Begin CPR and apply your AED. Evaluate for shock and adequate perfusion. If the mechanism of injury suggests trauma, assess for bleeding and treat appropriately. Make your transport decision. Always transport near drowning patients to the hospital. Inhalation of any amount of fluid can lead to delayed complications lasting for days or weeks. Decompression sickness and air embolism must be treated in a recompression chamber and you should perform all of your interventions en route. Take a history. Investigate the chief complaint and obtain a medical history. Be alert for injury specific signs and symptoms as well as any pertinent negatives. Review the sample history and determine the length of time the patient was underwater or the time of onset of symptoms in relation to the last dive. Note any physical activity, alcohol or drug use, or any other medical conditions. Determine the dive parameters in your history, including depth, time, and previous diving activity. Perform a physical exam. If the patient is responsive, thoroughly examine his or her lungs, including breath sounds. If unresponsive, look for hidden life threats and potential trauma, even if trauma is not suspected. For divers, look for indications of the bends or air embolism, and check for signs of hypothermia. Obtain a Glasgow Coma Scale score to assess neurologic status and complete a detailed full body scan en route to the hospital. Assess for peripheral pulses, skin color, temperature and condition, itching, pain, paresthesias or numbness and tingling, and assess vital signs. Check the patient's pulse rate, quality and rhythm. It may be difficult to palpate if your patient is hypothermic. Check for both peripheral and central pulses and listen over the chest for a heartbeat if pulses are weak. Check the respiratory rate, quality, and rhythm. Assess and document pupil size and reactivity. Regarding monitoring devices, remember oxygen saturation readings may produce a false low because of hypoperfusion or shivering. Repeat the primary assessment. Drowning patients may deteriorate rapidly due to pulmonary injury, fluid shifts in the body, cerebral hypoxia, hypothermia. Air embolism or decompression sickness patients may decompensate quickly. Assess your patient's mental status constantly and assess vital signs every five minutes, paying particular attention to respirations and breath sounds. Treat for drowning, and this begins with rescue and removal from the water. Artificial ventilation should begin as soon as possible, even before the victim is removed. Stabilize and protect the C-spine, especially after a long fall or dive. Regarding communications and documentation, you should document the circumstances of the drowning and extrication, the time submerged, the temperature of the water, the clarity of the water, and the possibility of spinal injury. Bring a dive log or dive computer if available to record the dive history. Bring all dive equipment to the hospital and document the disposition of these materials. If the patient does not have possible spinal injury, turn them on their left side. Remove any upper airway obstruction manually or by suction. If necessary, use abdominal thrusts followed by assistive ventilations. Administer oxygen and keep the patient warm. Specifically for air embolism or decompression sickness, remove the patient from the water, try and keep them calm, administer oxygen, 
Place them in the left lateral recumbent position with their head down and provide prompt transport to the nearest recompression facility for treatment. With other water hazards, you should pay close attention to the body temperature of a person who is rescued from cold water. Treat hypothermia caused by immersion in cold water the same way you treat hypothermia caused by cold exposure. Breath holding syncope. A person who is swimming in shallow water may experience a loss of consciousness caused by a decreased stimulus for breathing. Hyperventilation lowers the carbon dioxide level and the swimmer may not feel the need to breathe even after using up all of the oxygen in their lungs. Treatment is the same as that for a patient who is drowned. Injuries caused by water hazards may be complicated by immersion in cold water. These include injuries from boat propellers, sharp rocks, water skis, and dangerous marine life. Treatment includes removing the patient from the water and taking care to protect the spine. Administering oxygen and applying dressing and splints if indicated. Monitor the patient closely for any signs of immersion or cold injury. And remember that a child who is involved in a drowning may be the victim of child abuse. Appropriate precautions can prevent most immersion incidents. All pools should be surrounded by a fence and the most common problem is lack of adult supervision. Half of all teenage and adult drownings are associated with the use of alcohol. We're going to talk about high altitude issues next. Disparism injuries are caused by the difference between the surrounding atmospheric pressure and the total gas pressure in various tissues, fluids, and cavities of the body. For altitude illnesses, these are caused by diminished oxygen pressure in the air at high altitudes on the central nervous system and the pulmonary system. They result in unacclimatized people ascending to a high altitude, a result of unacclimatized people ascending to a high altitude. The first one we're going to talk about is acute mountain sickness. Acute mountain sickness is generally occurs above 8,000 feet and it's a diminished oxygen level in the blood caused, which causes hypoxia. It's caused by ascending too high, too fast, or not being acclimatized to high altitudes. The signs and symptoms can include headache, lightheadedness, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea, difficulty sleeping, shortness of breath during physical exertion, and a swollen face. The next is high altitude pulmonary edema, or HAPE and this occurs generally above 10,000 feet. Fluid collects in the lungs, hindering the passage of oxygen into the bloodstream. The signs and symptoms include shortness of breath, cough with pink frothy sputum, cyanosis, and rapid pulse. The last is high altitude cerebral edema, or HACE, and this occurs above 12,000 feet. It may accompany HAPE and can quickly become life-threatening. Symptoms of HACE and HAPE may overlap. Some of these include a severe constant throbbing headache, ataxia or lack of muscle coordination, extreme fatigue, vomiting, and loss of consciousness. Treatment includes providing oxygen, descending them from a height, and transporting the patient. The next type of environmental emergency we're going to discuss is lightning injuries. There are an estimated 25 million cloud-to-ground lightning strikes each year in the United States, and lightning is the third most common cause of death from isolated environmental phenomena. Targets of direct lightning strikes include people who are engaged in outdoor activities like boaters, swimmers, and golfers, and anyone in a large open area. Many individuals are indirectly struck when standing near an object that has been struck by lightning, such as a tree, and this is called the splash effect. The cardiovascular and nervous systems are the most commonly injured, and respiratory or cardiac arrest is the most common cause of lightning-related deaths. The tissue damage pathway usually occurs over the skin rather than through it. You should look for not only the entrance wound, but also the exit wound. And because of the duration of a lightning strike being short, skin burns are usually superficial. Categories of lightning injuries. Mild. These include loss of consciousness, amnesia, confusion, tingling, other nonspecific signs and symptoms, and burns, if present, will typically be superficial. Moderate, which include seizures and respiratory arrest, and cardiac standstill or asystole that spontaneously resolves, as well as superficial burns. Severe lightning injury results in cardiopulmonary arrest and many of these patients do not survive. Emergency medical care includes taking measures to protect yourself from being struck by lightning. Move the patient to a sheltered area and if shelter is not available, recognize the signs of an impending lightning strike and take immediate action to protect yourself. If you suddenly feel a tingling sensation or your hair stands on end, the area around you has become charged 
which is the sign of an imminent lightning strike. Make yourself as small a target as possible by squatting down into a ball close to, close to but not touching the ground. Move away from trees or other tall objects and use reverse triage. Anyone who is in cardiac or respiratory arrest is your first priority during a lightning strike and other people who may have been struck will not develop cardiac complications. Treatment includes stabilization of the spine and opening the airway with a jaw thrust maneuver. If a pulse is present, assist ventilations, and if there is no pulse, use an AED as soon as possible. If severe bleeding is present, control it immediately and transport to the nearest facility. Moving on, the next thing we're going to talk about is bites and envenomations. We'll start with spider bites. Spiders are numerous and widespread in the United States, and there are many species. Only two spiders native to the United States, the female black widow and the brown recluse, deliver serious, even life-threatening bites. Your safety is of paramount importance. The black widow spider is, female black widow spider is fairly large, measuring approximately two inches across with its legs extended. It's usually black with a distinctive bright red-orange marking in the shape of an hourglass on its abdomen. The female is larger and more toxic than the male. They're found in every state except Alaska, and they prefer dry, dim places around buildings, in wood piles, and among debris. The bite is sometimes overlooked. If the site becomes numb right away, the patient may not even recall being bit. However, most black widow spider bites contain local, cause localized pain and symptoms, including agonizing muscle spasms. A bite on the abdomen may cause muscle spasms so severe that they resemble an acute abdomen. The main danger is the venom, which is poisonous to nerve tissues. Other systemic symptoms include dizziness, sweating, nausea, vomiting, rashes, a tight feeling in the chest, difficulty breathing, and severe cramps. Generally, these signs and symptoms subside over 48 hours. A physician can administer a specific antivenin, but because of the high incidence of side effects, its use is reserved for very severe bites the aged are very feeble and children under the age of five. Muscle spasms are usually treated in the hospital with IV benzodiazepines such as diazepam or Valium and lorazepam or Ativan. Emergency treatment consists of BLS for the patient in respiratory distress. If time permits, apply an ice pack to the bite area and clean the wound with soap and water and transport the patient to the emergency department as quickly as possible. If possible, bring the spider in a container. The brown recluse spider is a dull brown in color and about an inch long. The short-haired body has a violin-shaped mark, brown to yellow in color, on its back. It lives mostly in the southern and central parts of the country, but may be found throughout the continental United States. It tends to live in dark areas as well, such as in the corners of old, unused buildings and under rocks and in wood piles. In cooler areas, it moves indoors to closets, drawers, cellars, and old piles of clothing. The venom is not neurotoxic, but it's cytotoxic. It causes severe local tissue damage. Typically, the bite is not painful at first, but becomes so within hours, and the area will become swollen and tender, developing a pale mottled cyanotic center and possibly a small blister. A scab of dead skin, fat, and debris will form and dig down into the skin, producing a large ulcer that may not heal until tr unless it's treated promptly. Transport patients with such symptoms as soon as possible, and remember, this rarely causes systemic symptoms and signs. When they do, the initial treatment is BLS and transportation to the emergency department. Hymenoptera stings. This includes stings by bees, wasps, ants, and yellow jackets. Their stings are painful but are not a medical emergency. Remove the stinger and venom sack if present using a firm edged item like a credit card to scrape the stinger and sack off the skin. If you inadvertently squeeze the venom sac while trying to grasp the stinger with tweezers or forceps, you will worsen the patient's exposure by increasing the amount of envenomation. Anaphylaxis may occur if the patient is allergic to the venom. The signs and symptoms include flushed skin, low blood pressure, difficulty breathing, usually associated with reactive airway sounds, swelling to the throat and the tongue, and this is a dire emergency because it can be fatal if left untreated, hives or urticaria, near the site of envenomation or centrally on the body. Treatment includes being prepared to assist the patient in administering an EpiPen auto-injector and being prepared to support airway and breathing. Snake bites. Snake bites are a worldwide problem of some significance. More than 300,000 injuries from snake bites occur worldwide and each year 300 to 400,000 people die of snake bites worldwide. Snake bites in the United States occur less often but about 40 to 50,000 are reported yearly. 
Snakebite fatalities in the U.S. are extremely rare, and there's only about 15 a year for the entire country. Of the approximately 115 different species of snakes native to the United States, only 19 are venomous. These include the rattlesnake, the copperhead, the cottonmouth or water moccasin, and coral snakes. At least one of these poisonous species is found in every state except Alaska, Hawaii, and Maine. And you can see pictures of them here. Snakes usually do not bite unless you provoke them, you anger them, or they're accidentally injured, as when they are stepped on except for cottonmouths, which are often aggressive. Most snake bites occur between April and October and tend to involve young men who have been drinking. Protect yourself from getting bitten. Use extreme caution on these calls and wear the proper PPE for the area. Only one-third of snake bites result in significant local or systemic injuries, and often envenomation does not occur because the snake recently struck another animal and exhausted its supply of venom. With the exception of the coral snake, poisonous snakes native to the United States have hollow fangs in the roof of the mouth that inject the poison from two sacs at the back of the head. The classic appearance of the poisonous snake bite is two small puncture wounds, usually about 0.5 inches apart, with discoloration, swelling, and pain. Non-poisonous snakes can also bite, usually leaving a horseshoe of tooth marks. Fang marks are a clear indication of a poisonous snake bite. Pit vipers. Pit vipers include rattlesnakes, copperheads, and cottonmouths. They have triangular shaped flat heads. They also have small pits that contain poison located just behind each nostril and in front of each eye. The pit is a heat sensing organ that allows the snake to strike accurately at any warm target. The fangs are special hollow teeth that act much like hypodermic needles connected to a sac containing a reservoir of venom. The most common form of pit viper is the rattlesnake. They have many patterns of color, often with a diamond pattern, and they can grow to six feet or more in length. Copperheads are smaller than rattlesnakes. They're usually two to three feet long, and their reddish coppery color is crossed with brown or red bands. Typically, they inhabit wood piles and abandoned dwellings and account for most of the venomous snake bites in the eastern United States. Cottonmouths grow to about four feet in length. and they're also called water moccasins. They are olive or brown with black cross bands and a yellow undersurface. They are water snakes with an aggressive pattern of behavior and although fatalities from these snake bites are rare, tissue destruction from the venom may be severe. The signs of envenomation by a pit viper are severe burning pain at the site of the injury, followed by swelling and a bluish discoloration called ecchymosis. Signs are evident within five to 10 minutes and spread over the next 36 hours. In addition to destroying tissues locally, the venom of the pit viper can also interfere with the body's clotting mechanism and cause bleeding at various distant sites. Other signs that may or may not occur include weakness, nausea, vomiting, sweating, seizures, and fainting, as well as vision problems, change in level of consciousness, and shock. If the patient has no local signs an hour after being bitten, it is safe to assume that envenomation did not take place. If swelling has occurred, Mark its edges on the skin and do not confuse a fainting spell with shock. If shock occurs, it generally happens much later. When treating a bite from a pit viper, take the following steps. Calm your patient and have the patient lie flat, face up, and explain that staying quiet will slow the spread of venom through the system. Locate the bite area, clean it gently with soap and water, and do not apply ice. If the bite occurred on an arm or leg, splint the extremity to decrease movement. Be alert for signs of vomiting, which may be a sign of anxiety rather than the toxin itself. Do not give anything by mouth. If the patient was bitten on the trunk, keep him or her supine and quiet and transport as quickly as possible. Monitor vital signs and mark the skin with a pen over the area that is swollen. If there are any signs of shock, treat for it. If the snake has been killed, bring it with you and notify the hospital that the patient has been bitten by a snake. If possible, describe it. Transport promptly. If the patient shows no signs of envenomation, provide BLS as needed and place the patient, place a sterile dressing over the suspected bite area and immobilize the injury site. All patients with a suspected snake bite should be taken to the emergency department and you should treat the wound as you would any deep puncture wound to prevent infection. And know your local medical protocol for handling snake bites. Coral snakes are small reptiles with a series of bright red, yellow, and black bands that completely encircle their body. Red on yellow will kill a fellow, red on black venom will lack. Common saying. 
A relative of the cobra snake, it lives in most southern states and in the southwest. It injects the venom with its teeth and tiny fangs by a chewing motion, leaving puncture wounds. Because of its small mouth and teeth and limited jaw expansion, the coral snake usually bites its victims on a small part of the body, such as the finger or toe. Coral snake venom is a powerful toxin that causes paralysis of the nervous system. Within a few hours of being bitten, a patient will exhibit bizarre behavior, followed by progressive paralysis of eye movements and respiration. Successful treatment depends on positive identification of the snake and supportive respirations. Antivenin is available, but most hospitals do not stock it. Emergency care, you need to immediately quiet and reassure the patient. Flush the area of the bite with one to two quarts of warm soapy water to wash away any poison. Do not apply ice. You should splint the extremity and check and monitor the patient's baseline vital signs. Keep the patient warm and elevate the lower extremities to help prevent shock. Give oxygen if needed and transport promptly, giving hospital personnel notice that the patient has been bitten by a coral snake. Give the patient nothing by mouth. Scorpion stings. Scorpions are eight-legged arachnoids with a venom gland and a stinger at the end of their tail. They are rare and live primarily in the southwest U.S. and in the deserts. With one exception, a scorpion sting is usually very painful but not dangerous, causing localized swelling and discoloration. The exception is the Centroids sculpturaris. The venom of this species can produce a severe systemic reaction that brings about circulatory collapse, severe muscle contractions, excessive salivation, hypertension, convulsions, and cardiac failure. If you are called to care for a patient with a suspected sting from C. sculpturatus, notify medical control as soon as possible. Administer all the elements of basic life support and transport the patient rapidly. Ticks are tiny insects that usually attach themselves directly to the skin. They are found most often on brush, shrubs, trees, sand dunes, and other animals. Only a fraction of an inch in length, they can easily be mistaken for freckles. The bite is not painful, and the danger with a tick bite is from the infecting organism spread through the tick's saliva. And this is a picture of a tick. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever occurs within 7 to 10 days after a tick bite, and the symptoms are nausea, vomiting, headache, weakness, paralysis, and cardiorespiratory collapse. Lyme disease has been reported in 35 states, and the first symptom, a rash that may spread to several parts of the body, begins about three days after a patient is bitten by an infected tick. In about a third of the patients, the rash eventually resembles a target bullseye pattern. After a few more days or weeks, painful swelling of the joints, particularly the knees, occurs. Lyme disease may be confused with rheumatoid arthritis and may result in permanent disability. If it is recognized and treated promptly with antibiotics, the patient may recover completely. Tick bites occur most commonly during the summer, and transmission of the infection from tick to person takes at least 12 hours, so if you are called on to remove a tick, you should proceed carefully and slowly. Do not attempt to suffocate or burn the tick. By using fine tweezers, you grasp the tick by the body and pull it straight out of the skin. This will usually remove the whole tick. Once the tick is removed, paint the area with disinfectant and save the tick in a glass jar for identification. Do not handle it with your fingers, and you should provide any necessary supportive care and transport the patient to the hospital. Marine animal injuries. Cholelanthrates are responsible for more envenomations than any other marine animal. The ex examples include the fire coral, the Portuguese man of war, the sea wasp, sea nettles, true jellyfish, sea anemones, true coral, and soft coral. The stinging cells are called nematocysts. The signs and symptoms of marine animal stings include very painful reddish lesions in light-skinned individuals, lesions extending in the line from the site of the sting, headache, dizziness, muscle cramps, and fainting. To treat the sting from the tentacles of a jellyfish, a Portuguese man of war, various anemones, corals, or hydras, the patient needs to be removed from the water. Pour acetic acid, which is vinegar, on the affected area. Do not try to manipulate the remaining tentacles as this will only cause further discharge of the nematocysts. Remove the tentacles by scraping them off with the edge of a sharp, stiff object such as a credit card. On rare occasions, a patient may have a systemic allergic reaction, and this patient should be treated as an anaphylactic shock. Give BLS and provide immediate transport to the hospital. Toxins from the spines of urchins, stingrays, and certain spiny fish, such as the lionfish, scorpionfish, or stonefish, are heat sensitive. 
The best treatment is to immobilize the affected area and soak it in hot water for 30 minutes. The patient will still need to be transported. If you work near the ocean, you should be familiar with marine life in your area. The Emergency Department of Common Coelentrate Envenomations, the Emergency Treatment of Common Coelentrate Envenomations consists of the following. Limit further discharge of pneumatocysts by avoiding fresh water, wet sand, showers, or careless manipulation of the tentacles. Keep your patient calm and reduce motion of the affected extremity. Inactivate the pneumatocysts by applying vinegar. If you don't have vinegar, isopropyl alcohol may be used, but it is not as effective. Remove the remaining tentacles by scraping them off with the edge of a sharp, stiff object and provide transport to the emergency department. In summary, we'll talk about each of the environmental emergencies very quickly. Cold illness can be either local or systemic. Local cold injuries include frostbite, frost nip, and immersion foot. Frostbite is the most serious because tissues actually freeze. All patients with a local cold injury should be removed from the cold and protected from further exposure. If instructed to do so by medical control, rewarm frostbitten parts by immersing them in water at a temperature between 100 and 112 degrees. The key to treating hypothermic patients is to stabilize vital functions and prevent further heat loss. Do not attempt to rewarm patients who have moderate to severe hypothermia because they are prone to developing arrhythmias. Do not consider a patient dead until he or she is warm and dead. Local protocol will dictate whether or not such patients receive cardiopulmonary resuscitation and or defibrillation in the field. The body's regulatory mechanisms normally maintain body temperature within a very narrow range around 98.6. Body temperature is regulated by heat loss to the atmosphere via conduction, convection, evaporation, radiation, and respiration. Heat illness can take three forms, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke. Heat cramps are painful muscle spasms that occur with vigorous exercise. Treatment includes removing the patient from the heat, resting the affected muscles, and replacing lost fluids. Heat exhaustion is essentially a form of hypovolemic shock caused by dehydration. Symptoms include cold, clammy skin, weakness, confusion, headache, and rapid pulse. Body temperature can be high and the patient may or may not still be sweating. Treatment includes removing the patient from the heat and treating for mild hypovolemic shock. Heat stroke is a life-threatening emergency and it's usually fatal if left untreated. Patients with heat stroke are usually dry and will have high body temperatures. Changes in mental status can include coma. Rapid lowering of the body temperature in the field is crucial. The first rule in caring for drowning victims is to be sure not to become a victim yourself. Protect the spine when removing patients from the water because cord injuries often occur in drownings. Be aware of the possibility of hypothermia. Injuries associated with scuba diving may, not be, may be immediately apparent or may show up hours later. Patients with air embolism or decompression sickness may have pain, paralysis, or altered mentation. Be prepared to transport such patients to a recompression facility with a hyperbaric chamber. Poisonous spiders include the black widow and the brown recluse. Poisonous snakes include pit vipers and coral snakes. A person who has been bitten by a pit viper needs prompt transport. Clean the bite area and keep the patient quiet to slow the spread of venom. Notify the hospital as soon as possible if a patient has been bitten by a coral snake. Its venom can cause paralysis of the nervous system and most hospitals do not have appropriate antivenin on hand. Patients who have been bitten by ticks may be infected with Rocky Mountain spotted fever or Lyme disease and should see a doctor within a day or two. Removing the tick with tweezers and saving it for identification is important. Always provide prompt transport to the hospital for any patient who has been bitten by a poisonous insect or animal. Remember that vital signs can deteriorate rapidly and you should carefully monitor, monitor the patient's vital signs en route, especially for airway compromise. Thanks for your attention and as always, bring questions to class with your instructor.